Samarang City on the north coast of Java, Indonesia. The morning commute can sometimes be hell. And when the environment changes so rapidly, it's difficult to keep heads above water. Large sections of the city are sinking right in front of people's eyes. That's because of land subsidence, sea level rise, and changing weather patterns related to climate change. Environmental changes are happening all across Asia. People there are being forced to adapt to a new level of reality, and the results are both disturbing and remarkable. Mohamed Helmi is a marine scientist at Semarang's Dipo Nogoro University. He tracks the city's sinking problem. During high tide, seawater inundates the land, submerging streets and buildings, ponds and fields. Semarang seaport has been particularly hard hit. This place has been abandoned because they can't raise it above the water anymore. Those buildings there are no longer being used because the water levels keep on rising. You can still see the trucks and ships are being docked in a port that should no longer be used. The main cause of the city's subsidence is building on wetlands and overbuilding in the downtown area. That, combined with many artesian wells pumping water from the ground, it's sinking by as much as 10 centimeters a year. But that's not all. Tidal data in the area shows that sea level is rising by four millimeters per year, with this increase attributed to global warming. So the land is sinking and the sea is rising, a dangerous combination. And we can see that after a hundred year, at least uh, 35% of a Samarang city will be covered by water. Villages up and down the coast are sinking too. Normal daily tides now flood once productive fish and shrimp farms. 20 years ago, these ponds were mangrove forests. They were ripped out to take advantage of the high profits from exporting shrimp. This is the village of Rijasori. Two decades ago, it was a prosperous community of more than a thousand people. Today, the kids from the few remaining families play in toy boats in flooded front yards, while their parents make a living fishing in what used to be part of Main Street. Even closer to Semarang City, perhaps two kilometers away, is the village of Dipo Indar. For more than six months of the year, houses are flooded out by rain and tides. It's transformed the lives of Puji and his wife Suliam. We have been living here since 1983. We have tried to fix this place up a number of times using concrete and wood. We continue to live here because we don't have anywhere to go. My family is out in the villages, but the land is just enough for them. I'm working from job to job and sometimes there are no projects, so we just stay here. 
We don't have any money, so we can't buy another house. Sometimes when the rain is heavy, the water gets up to 40 centimeters. Even Semarang's sacred ground seems to be no match for the flooding. Yang berada di sini, yang di kubur sini adalah the holy person who's buried here passed away in 1947. In the past, this used to be a public burial ground, and it was surrounded by land. It was maybe 200 or 300 meters from the coast. Now, as you can see, it's in the middle of the water. People now travel by boat to pray. Ten years ago, this used to be farmland. Today, the cemetery of the saints, protected behind its retaining wall, is all that's left. Satabi is 50. He used to live in Rejosori, and he too was flooded out. His solution was to flee. He could afford to. He still works as a fisherman in the old village. In my previous village, the problem of flooding started about four or five years ago. Sometimes the flood came up to my bed, so I couldn't stand to live there anymore. Satabi got help from Mr. Mariano, a government official helping people to relocate. The government has been trying to relocate the population overcome by the flooding. Carefully, since 2006, we've relocated around 200 families. And that's been done so that the people can firstly live and sleep comfortably, in a location with no flooding. The moving day was very busy because I had to knock down all of my old house, and using a boat and truck, I brought everything here. Once I got here, I still had to buy some more materials like brick and stone. There are families living here that still need to be relocated because the flooding will not subside and it will actually increase, taking over even more land. But the folks of Semarang are a resilient lot, and Chotabi, who owns a fish pond, has his own solution to the flooding problem. Every month or so, I take the mud from the bottom of the pond and I put the mud on top of the dikes to make them higher. What I'm trying to do is protect the fish in my pond from escaping into the river when the tidal floods come. Besides building walls higher to keep out the flooding, people are also looking to mangroves as part of the solution. These hardy trees can thrive in salty water. Terus mengapa kami menanam mangrove? Karena satu daerah sini daerah yang terkena abrasi. 
We are concerned about the loss of mangroves because we know that the soil erosion in this particular area is very high. If we plant mangroves here, they will cut erosion and act as a windbreak. Angin dan selanjutnya mungkin menyaring air. One idea is to fill the shrimp and fish ponds with mud and replant the mangrove forests on top, basically reclaiming the land bit by bit. But Semarang's sinking condition has also brought out the entrepreneurial spirit. Against the odds, people are surviving and thriving. Sopadiwano, recently retired from the railroad, has taken full advantage of a flooded freight yard. This land actually belongs to the railroad company. Around 1985, the water started increasing and they started getting rid of the trains. I tried to make a fish pond just for myself and my family here, not for commercial use. But there were too many fish, and so many people wanted to come and fish, so I decided to open it to people for recreation. And now the business is quite good, giving a profit of about 40 to 50,000 rupee per day. Sopadiwano uses some of that profit to underwrite a preschool centre for his neighbour's kids. But these kids have a very uncertain future. There's been a lot of studies and research around the flooding and subsidence in Semarang. For instance, how big the impact of sea level rise is and the impact of heavy rain. But we still need to find solutions that can overcome the flooding problem effectively and quickly. So, after years of rapid development, Semarang is learning that it's no longer business as usual. Now, they need effective actions to solve their problems. By contrast, 1,500 kilometers to the north, another coastal community with a history of violent and unpredictable weather struggles with similar problems, but with some surprisingly positive results. Vietnam is just as concerned about flooding, sea level rise and changing weather patterns as Indonesia. For the Vietnamese, mangroves are a first line of defense against these environmental changes. Indeed, mangroves are so important, they hire wardens to keep them safe. My name is Mr. Chang Van Tung. I was born in 1943 and I've been living here for more than 20 years. Mr. Tung worked as a farmer most of his life, but since 2001 he has patrolled the mangrove forests. It's a 30-minute commute to work along the dikes. I walk into the mangrove forest to see if any intruders have cut down the trees. Some people do not realize the importance of the mangroves for protecting the environment. So my role is to advise them, to educate them, not to enter the forest and destroy the mangrove trees. Vietnam is one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world. Typhoons and violent storms are frequent, with often calamitous consequences. 
The country's entire 3,000-kilometer coastline is low-lying, heavily populated, and extremely vulnerable. Vietnam is the world's second largest exporter of rice. The Mekong Delta in the south is Vietnam's breadbasket. But the World Bank estimates the Delta is more at risk from sea level rise than any place in the world. The population in the Mekong Delta is about 18 million. And is playing a very important role in uh, supplying the production of uh, rice and, uh, in general, food for the, uh, not only for the Mekong Delta itself, but also for the country. Uh, so if climate change occurring, especially sea level rise, then it will affect very significantly the Mekong Delta. As Mr. Tung patrols his forest, he worries about more than just his mangroves. When I was young, I did not realize that the climate would change. We didn't have technologies, television or radio. But when you get older, particularly when all the news about climate change is broadcast by the government, you realize that the climate is changing nowadays. Mr. Fong is a local farmer who has weathered many storms in the past 30 years. An unexpected storm this past January was for him another example of how the climate is changing. I grow two crops here, watermelon and sweet corn. Climate was not like this in the past. When I was younger, it was not as bad as it is now. Not as many storms and floods every year. But now we see a lot of typhoons, storms and very high levels of water. Because this is the sandy side along the sea coast, there is a very high content of sand in this land, so that it is very easily washed away by strong waves. The waves from the storm in January swept through a thin covering of mangroves in front of his farm, taking out the dike and flooding the field beyond. The mangrove forest acts like a windbreak. However, the mangrove is not very thick or high. When strong winds and high waves come, the waves force through the trees. Then seawater reaches the site here where we are planting our crops. A mature and extensive mangrove forest had been cut down. The new plantings weren't strong enough to withstand the storm. They cut the mangrove trees down and used the wood as firewood or for fencing in the sea to catch fish. I have caught several guys who entered the forest and cut down some trees. The first time I told them it was wrong to cut down the trees and warned them not to do it again. But if I caught them doing it again, I would bring them to the local authorities to settle the problem. Dr. Fong is a wetlands forestry expert working for the government. For more than a decade, he's planted mangroves along this coastline. We need to understand the importance of the mangrove forest because it can help us minimize the effect of strong typhoons and strong waves. And it can also help to sequester carbon dioxide emissions. And the other thing is it can protect our dikes and agricultural crops behind the mangrove forest. The roots of the mangrove are very special. One digs deep into the soil and takes up water and nutrients. The second root takes its oxygen for breathing from the air. 
And when seawater rises higher than that route, it can take oxygen from the seawater. The Vietnamese government has set a target to plant 250,000 hectares of mangroves along the entire coastline. This is the area we are replanting. The mangroves will be one and a half by three meters apart. These seedlings are still young and it will take some time for the roots to penetrate into the ground. So the grower needs to tie the seedlings to a stick for support. But planting more mangroves is only part of Vietnam's response to a globally warming world. Many people raising shrimp are now considering a fish that is easily collected from the mangroves and ideally adapted to a changing climate. Uh, Muskip uh, are one of the best species for the farmers to uh, culture uh, instead of only shrimp. They can tolerate a wide range of salinity. So when the climate change is uh, occurring, there are some change in salinity, some change in environmental conditions, they can still be uh, adapting. Mr. Fan has switched from growing shrimp to mudskippers. In this pond, I release six kilograms of mudskipper babies, and after five months, I harvest more than two tons of fish. The profit from mudskipper is about 60%. If I raise shrimp, I only get about 30 to 35%. On top of being easy to raise and bringing a good price at market, mudskippers have a strong local following. Everywhere you go in the Delta, mudskippers are on the menu, sautéed, boiled and baked. For many, mudskippers are more popular than shrimp. A perfect species for a globally warming world. Even though Mr. Tung spends his working life as a mangrove warden, he knows that mangroves are not, by themselves, enough to cope with a changing climate. Sea level rise is something I am also worried about. I think that the dikes around here should be built higher by the government, with maybe help from abroad to protect the community from future flooding. Many existing dikes in the delta are now being built higher, and new dikes are made stronger using concrete with steel reinforcement. Even new roads and bridges over the many rivers flowing through the Mekong Delta are being built in response to climate change, dwarfing roadside settlements and leaving their habitants agog. Many in Vietnam think the changing climate is a serious threat that requires immediate action. The worry is that it could be a problem too big to handle locally. Our family and all the people living here in this community will put our best effort and labor to build a dike to protect our crop. But because we lack the means, we can't really make a firm dike to protect our land. We expect the government to assist us in making the dike here.
As people in Asia adapt to a new reality, many realize there is little time to waste and that restoring mangroves could be one of their best investments for the future.